greetings, 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 greetings. It says, I again, your king, Clifford Jefferson, descendant of Godfrey, the fifth kind of man, Jew, son of folk, ruler of Jerusalem. I am the reincarnation of King Edgar the people. In that day, in your day and time, you call him Jesus Christ, but to us, he's called King Edgar, the king of peace. Um, this is part two of uh, the lessons on dealing with the uh, getting our brothers and sisters or, or our people out of the state of hell. <clears throat> if you watch the video, uh, it was regarding the Taj Tariq uh, uh, in regards to nationality. Nationality is the situation uh, that we have to face in regards to who we are as a people. And the King's benches are, are declaring and proclaim and have declared and proclaimed that we are English people. Um, the problem is, as you as you hear from the video, if you watch part one of this episode, you see Taj Sharif, that uh, one of the uh, voices of the Morris Nation in regards to returning his people back to their estate uh, that was divine, that was divinely prepared by their elders who have passed on known as ancestors. But uh, the language and the origin that he reach, reaches for in regards to that solution uh, of bringing them to their people is not from the origin or nation that he speaks about. It's from the English nation. And the subject matter in regards to the English nation is in regards to getting uh, people out of a state of hell, which has a legal and lawful definition uh, which means those who are who pay who lacks to pay the debt back, as Archbishop said, known as being common sukkahs, back to the king. Whatever monarch was ruling at that time, you owe a free and common sukkahs. Uh, what was called free and common sukkahs has transferred to what they call feudal tenure, uh, which had been abolished as of 1664, uh, and had returned back to free and common sukkahs as under the king, because we know that the treaty of uh, uh, Paris of 1783 has separated Great Britain from the United States, but yet there is a reconciliation of Great Britain uh, in regards to Title 16, uh, uh, colon 1, Section 28, right, saying in charge of Great Britain, safe from repeal. And in order for that to happen, there must be a corporation of soul, which I am. So I have incorporated to the office as king, as natural person, and corporate at the same time. Uh, there to preserve the estate that was left from left from the grant to I.A. our ancestors who were ruling under what we call parliament under the king's bench who were ruler or classes from the house of lords subject to their king. All right, and that as uh, Todd said that the remedy is in the chancery because the chancery deals with estates left for heirs, not fee and simple, but entail. And we have an entail estate as uh, declared by the charter. And when we say charter, we mean the great charter, the Magna Carta. And that descended down from the House of Plantation, as you see flying behind, behind the King's bench. Uh, so without further ado, we get, we'll get ready, prepare ourselves to give you part two. I'll let Archbishop say a couple of words and we get on with this marvelous lesson. Greetings again. Greetings. Greetings, brothers and sisters. Please, um, we ask you to pay close attention to these videos and what's being said. Um, you know, keep all emotions in check because what's being said is not something that we're saying. It was legislatively not only construed, but um, it was left for those for a time that was going to be brought or going to be shown on the planet, which we're dealing with right now, which is planet out beyond, um, that you need to start heeding warnings because you don't have much time. Uh, once these gates close, they're, they're closed. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. All right. Once again, welcome back to the King's Bench. Uh, once again, as we told you in our part one, uh, the lesson is going to be in part. Uh, try to keep it down to a minimum, about 20 minutes to a half an hour. Hopefully we won't go over that, but if we do, forgive us. Uh, we know it's hard to stay focused on information that one newly to new to you, uh, three information that's uh, that as well is well informed and that you have never heard it before. Uh, when of course I'm pretty sure you have not. Um, if those who actually view part one, uh, you heard, heard heard Todd speak of the language that you hear so frequently spoken here at the King's Bench. 
So that should be an eye opener as well to hear Taj of the Morris Nation speak about such things as the courts of chancery, courts of common pleas, the courts of uh, ex chamber chamber, as well as the, the ex court and as well as the courts of common pleas, the ex secretary of pleas. All right. So we're going to explain these terms for you and break this down to give the people understanding of how to get out of the situation they're in. All right. And um, you know, um, we're not one to talk. I, I know a lot of people who have been on our podcast uh, are saying, well, where, where are your works? And a lot of things are being done with the King's Bench are done behind the scenes that are done eternally for the external. You know, do engrams or what we call uh, 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 autobiological memory because our, our ancestors teach us every day and um, they bring us solutions uh, in regards to this chess game that we're playing, you know, and we we think eight moves ahead. And uh, we understand uh, what Taj is saying in regards to the state of mind our people in, which causes the hell that we're in. And um, we come to change our mind, uh, people's minds so that their body will follow. Anything the mind do, the body will follow. You know, so uh, without further ado, let's get started. Everybody can see that? Yeah, they should be able to see it. How is the uh, resolution? No, this, this is good. All right, all right, sir. You can start reading it for him. Court of Chantry. The Court of Chantry was a court of equity in England and Wales that followed a set of loose rules to avoid the slow pace of change and possible harshness or inequity of the common law. The Chantry had jurisdiction over all matters of equity, including trust, land law, the estates of lunatics, and the guardianship of infants. Its initial role was somewhat different. As an extension of the Lord Chancellor's role as keeper of the King's conscience, the court was an administrative body primarily concerned with conscientious law. Yeah. Okay. So as read about the courts of uh, chancery is a court of the common law that deals with equity. All right. You got courts of law and courts of equity. And it deals with trust, land law. It deals with lunatics. Uh, actually, those who are, you know, assumed to be crazy out of their mind, which uh, that appears to be the case with those who build the king's bench. We're out of our mind, but we're going to show you we're not out of our, our mind. It's you who are out of your mind. Okay. Exactly. Uh, uh, it deals with guardianship of infants. You know, its initial role was somewhat different as an extension of the Lord's Chancellor role as keeper of the king's consciousness. The court was an administrative body primarily concerned with consciousness, conscientious law. Okay. So the first thing. <coughs> If people claim to have an estate, we know an estate uh, deals with uh, a trust. Because a state is assets, right? Assets, which can be anything, uh, uh, movable property, personal property, uh, fixtures, ETC. Uh, it could be money, uh, and it, could, it could be anything. But in the court case of chancery, uh, it was designed by judges that are consist of uh, or headed by what we call the Lord Chancellor. And he was keeper of the King's Constance. What is the King's Constance? The King's Constance is a history of, of knowing uh, the history of a king in regards to the kingship involving the king's brim called the crown. In regards to the law, his subjects, his officials, ETC. All right, very important. So let's get a a better understanding, just uh, Wikipedia is a great tool, by the way, for just getting some clarity on what we're talking about, because apparently you hear Taz talked about, so there must be some validity to it. All right. So he's speaking about the Court of Chancery, 
uh, as a remedy to those who are subject to the court of exchequer, courts of exchequer chamber, which was created under the Judicature Act of 1873 by the separation of the common law courts from equity, which is headed by the courts of chancery. Because when Charles Tariq spoke to the sister who was reading uh, from the Black Law Dictionary in regards to the definition of hell, uh, he asked her that you understood what it meant. She had no clue. And I'm pretty sure none of you have no clue because Charles did not break down courts of chancery like we're going to break it down. I didn't hear a thing about king, people of the king's conscience because he don't know a thing about a king. He know about a sultan, but don't know about a king. Mm -hmm. All right? Okay, keeper of the king's content. What is this? Read this one, Mars Bishop. Keeper of the king's conscience was a position in the English judiciary before the advent and parliamentary representative democracy. The person appointed as keeper of the king's conscience was usually a bishop. He was responsible for overseeing the international affairs of the monarchy and for delivering justice on behalf of the king. Today, this position has become the Lord Chancellor. During the period beginning from William the Conqueror to Henry, Henry VIII of England, the person holding the keeper of the king's conscience post also held high position in the church. Okay, so as you can see, Lord Chancellor, keeper of the uh, courts of chancery, dealt with matters concerning the king, which is called uh, Engl an English judiciary, a representation of a democracy, all right, headed by a bishop, all right? Now, in order to understand this, you got to understand the war, uh, history concerning the English Civil War with the war, what we call the Bishop's War, or the War of the Three Kingdoms. This was headed by the House of Stuart, with the, with, the House of, with the Church of Scotland, the Church of England, and the Church of Ireland, okay? It, it's a deep history, we're gonna go through that. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna break this down for you. But for, for, for today's lesson, understand that the, the Lord Chancellor was keeper of the King's Conscience, and he was headed by a bishop. And we know that our king bench is headed by Archbishop, who is a bishop. As you can see, these matters that we're dealing with concern the, uh, the, uh, the assistance of the bishop, i.e. Uh, Archbishop uh, from the House of uh, Belmont. Okay, so it says, for overseeing the international affairs of the monarchy for deliverance of justice on behalf of the king. And this dates back to the time of William the Conqueror. Mm -hmm. All right, now we know William the Conqueror invaded England in 1066. Remember that date, y'all, 1066. But let's see the origin of what we call the courts of common, courts of chancery, history. Read this from Archbishop. Origins. The court of chancery originated, as did the other high courts before 1875, in the Norman Curia Regis, or King's Council, maintained by most early rulers of England after 1066. Under the feudal system, the council was made up of the monarch, the great officers of the crown, and anyone else the monarch allowed to attend. Its jurisdiction was virtually unlimited with executive, judicial, and legislative functions. This large body contained lawyers, peers, and members of the church, many of whom lived far from London. It soon became apparent that it was too unwieldy to deal with the nation's day-to-day -day business. As a result, a smaller curia was formed to deal with the regular business of the country. And this soon split into various courts. First, the Exchequer Pleas to deal with finance, and then the Court of Common Pleas to deal with common cases. The Chancery started as the personal staff of the Lord Chancellor, described as a great secretarial bureau, a home office, a foreign office, and a ministry of justice. The earliest reference to legal issues being sent to him is from 1280, when Edward I of England annoyed with the number of cases coming to him, which could have been dealt with by other elements of his administration, passed a statute saying that all petitions which shall, excuse me, all petitions which touch the seal shall come first to the chancellor, and those which touch the exchequer to the exchequer, and those which touch the justices or the law of the land to the justices and those which touch the Jews to the justices of the Jews. And the affairs are so great, or if they are of grace, that the chancellor and the others cannot do it without the king. 
then they shall bring them in their own hands to the king to know his pleasure so that no petition shall come before the king and his council, but by the hands of his said chancellor and the other chief ministers, so that the king and his council may without the load of other business attend to the great business of his realm and of other foreign countries. Okay, so you see the statue passed by Edward the First of the Plantagen Crown. All right, very important to understand that in regards to the chancery, because we know that by the Judicial Act of 1873, it said that they split, and the, the that the Court of uh, Exchequer lost its equity uh, in dealing with the matters concerning criminal and civil uh, and on executive, legislative, judicial forum. Uh, was now became courts of common law, which mm -hmm. brings you to what we call the house of, or the court of common pleas. Now, as you're going to see with the court of common pleas, we should be subject to the chancery division as English heirs, uh, with matters being referred to, to the Lord Chancellor in regards to the King's consciousness. But before we go there, uh, one second, let's go back there. Did my screen stop? Stop saying okay. Give me one second. Yes, we still are. All right. Okay. All right. So we see the court of chancellor. Now, you notice under Edward the first statue, it says those. Now this was done by authority under the great sale. And it spoke about those that were under the chancellor, that the chancellor, those were under the courts, the exchequer, the exchequer, those were under the Jews. Uh, that goes under what we call the star chamber. But I'm we're gonna talk about that in later, later uh, classes. All right, and, 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 and we'll get to it, don't worry about it. All right, so we're talking about the uh, keeper of the king's consciousness. And what is the keeper of the king's consciousness in regards to conscientious law? What is this concern? A lot of y'all talk about natural law. Read that for Marty Bishop. Natural law. Natural law is a system of law based on the close observation of human nature and based on values intrinsic to human nature that can be deduced and applied independent of positive law, the enacted laws of a state or society. According to natural law theory, all people have inherent rights conferred not by act of legislation, but by God, nature, or reason. Natural law theory can also refer to the theories of ethics, theories of politics, theories of civil law, and theories of religious morality. Okay, so as we see dealing with natural law, they said that uh, natural law is a right conferred not by legislation, but by God, nature, and reason. But God, dealing with nature and reason from an abstract, can't write or do anything. Mm -hmm. So how a court going to determine the rights of something uh, that should have created legislation to determine heirs in regards to that uh, protection that was created under legislation? Because everything in here is protected by law, legislation. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? If there's nothing to prove or substantiate the lawfulness, anything that's legal, that's not lawful. Everything that's legal is not lawful. And I'm God is the God of order because if God and the devil can't dwell in the same place. 
Exactly. Uh, the devil is a negative and God is the positive. And you can have something to distinguish both, whether it's by works, deeds, or actions. By words, deeds, or actions. And you pretty much can't depend on the brother's words <laughs> based off their actions. So that's the reason why contracts are made. In case your word is broken based off your actions. All right? So we're dealing with nature, dealing with the conscientious of the keeper of the king's conscience that was handled by the Lord's chancellor and lieu of the Lord courts of chancery that deals with estates, trust, guardianship, uh, uh, assets, ETC, that were held under trust and I came back. Why? Because I'm the consciousness of the king. All mm -hmm. right? I'm going to show you why you've been subject to hell as debtors because the king has been gone. And this is a result of what we call the courts of common plea. All right. Let's go back there. Courts are coming, please. It's right there, brothers and sisters. Ain't nothing new. What's our time in the Archbishop? Uh, let me see. You don't actually tell me how much time it got. Uh, let me think we've been on. At least over 15 minutes. Okay, another 15, we'll wrap it up. Courts are coming, please, y'all. All right, now this is an English term. We know that they were under the king's bench, headed by the Lord's chancellor in regards to who were heirs and who were not heirs. Mm -hmm. If you wasn't an heir, then that means you're a subject. All right, and our heir, a subject of the king, and those who were not heirs, i.e. subjects of the kings. And those who were not heirs, subject to the kings, they have the right as heirs who are also subjects of the king, who are we call family members, descendants, ancestors. Very important, y'all. And if you can't even be the uh, 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 ancestor or descendant of what Todd was talking about in regards to getting out of hell, y'all better be listening to us. Mm -hmm. Y'all better be listening, all right? Because you at the mercy of your judges, lawyers, who are actually clergy or bishops, as we just said, according to the history that goes back to the term that Ty is talking about and we are talking about. But we're not dealing from a more, we're dealing from the Anglo-Saxon Berber descent because we were the English, all right? Read that, Archbishop. Court of Common Pleas, England. I right, says the Court of Common Pleas. Hold on, sorry about that. All right, so the, the Court of Common Pleas, or a common bench, was a common law court in the English legal system that covered common pleas actions between subject and subject, which did not concern the king. Stop. So it said like a court of common pleas or a common bench was a common, this is called a bench trial, all right? Because you got a right to a trial by a jury amongst your own peers. Your peers were the House of Lords. You don't have that now because you're not a pair, because you're not a lord. You're a common folk, mm -hmm. all right? You're a subject of a subject, all right? So it says that the couple common pleas actually between subject and subject, which did not concern the king. Why? Because in the United States, there is no king. So you're not the subject of the king if there is no king. That's a problem. Why? Because you just said it don't concern the king, all right? So now, well, they talking about that's in England. Okay, so let's show the connection between the courts of common pleas in England and the common courts of pleas in, 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 in modern day. Because mm -hmm. when you go to the court, you get pleas. This is a Black Law Dictionary. Pay attention, brothers and sisters, because you're not going to get a true understanding of law from those who call themselves to be attorneys at law. Only those who true law come from, which is English people, can come and give you this understanding of our law. All right, go ahead. Right there. All right, so plea. In old English law, a suit or action, thus the power to hold pleas is the power to take cognizance of actions or suits. So common pleas are actions or suits between private persons. 
and this meaning of the word still appears in the modern declarations, where it is stated, example, that the defendant has been summoned to answer the plaintiff in the plea of debt. Okay, you heard that? In the plea of debt. So you're in hell. Ain't nobody coming to your rescue. Mm -hmm. Because you're at the mercy of the court. The court doing business outside of the courts of chancery, which is headed by the Lord Chancellor, who speaks for the king. You ain't in no church. So the chancery is not even involved. You got matters concerning your property, dealing with child, they sent that right down to juvenile. Mm -hmm. Probate ain't a matter. It's not an issue. Because you can't prove that you got lawful guardianship because your child is considered incompetent, lunatic, because you're a lunatic. Mm -hmm. So now it becomes the board of the state. Now you got to pay a debt by a system created by Social Security under the new deal by created by Frederick D. Roosevelt, 1934. All right, so as we can see, any plea that you give in a court of common pleas, which is a modern day court, which is criminal or civil, is a court of common pleas, it goes back to the origin of England. All right, now we know that's separated from chancery. So if, if you have to plea in any court, because remember, the best uh, right you got in any court of law is the right to remain silent. Especially in those jurisdictions, because that's not where your equitable relief comes from. It's chancery. It's chancery. For the English people. For the English people, you got to put injunctions on the state. Because you're not living in states. You're living in colonies. Colonies. Well said. We don't live in the states. We live in colonies. How, how we know that? Let's show them. Before we do that, let's go to the courts of common pleas. Read that, Archbishop. All right, so the common pleas, once again, common pleas or common bench was a common law court. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not that. Court of exchequer, please. Yeah, exchequer, please. Exchequer, please. All right, so the exchequer of pleas or court of exchequer was a court that dealt with matters of equity a set of legal principles based on natural law and common law in England and Wales. Originally part of the Curia Regis or the King's Council, the Exchequer of Pleas split from the Curia in 1190 to sit as an independent central court. The Court of Chancery's reputation for tardiness and expense resulted in much of its business transferring to the Exchequer. The Exchequer and the Chancery with similar jurisdictions drew closer together over the years until an argument was made during the 19th century that having two seemingly identical courts was unnecessary. As a result, the exchequer lost its equity jurisdiction. With the Judicator Acts, the exchequer was formally dissolved as a judicial body by an order in council on December 16, 1880. Okay, this is regarding what we call the Judicial Care Act, uh, 1873. It's called the Exchequer Chamber. Now we know that Todd said that Anything below the exchequer chamber is hell. It's hell. All right, so let's see what the exchequer chamber is. Y'all better open your eyes to y'all king. Court of exchequer chamber. Oh, let me just show you. How does that look on the screen, Archbishop? Yeah, that looks good. All right. Okay. Every time my dog hears his son, he goes crazy. There he goes. It's going off, Coco. He do not like that commercial, that uh, uh, some commercial done with uh, washing. <laughs> All right. As you can see here, how to chan the uh, courts of chancery, uh, which we know, uh, split and became the exchequer. 
of pleas, which became the exchequer of chamber. Anything below that is hell, as Todd said, as well as what the Black Law Dictionary said, all right? And it was under Richard the First, which we go back to what we call time immemorial, all right? So this is the House of Lords, exchequer chamber, headed by the King's Bench. You said the King's Bench, that King's Bench is head of the uh, ex, uh, House of Chancery. And the, ex, the House of Chancery is represented by the Lord's Chancellor, and the Lord's Chancellor is keeping up the King's consciousness. So us being the King's Bench and I being the King, filing the claim in the jurisdiction of what we call uh, a court uh, a court of common pleas, the only belief in lieu of equity that can be sought for the English Third Temple Church of England and equity in lieu of Chancery is the House of Chancery or the Court of Chancery. Because as you can say, anything below that is hell. And we, when we say hell, we're talking about the local courts. You see that? Mm -hmm. These are your courts of pleas. Right there, y'all. Right, let's go back and get a little more insight. I'm going to do that. Read that for him, Archbishop. The Court of Exchequer Chamber was an English appellate court for, you got to scroll down, an English appellate court for common law civil actions before the Reforms Adjudicator Acts of 1873-1875. It originated in the 14th century, established in its final form by Statute of 1585. The court heard references from the King's Bench, the Court of Exchequer, and from 1830, directly rather than indirectly, from the Court of Common Pleas. You hear that? Read that paragraph again. It said the court heard references from the King's Bench, the Court of Exchequer, and from 1830, directly rather than indirectly, from the Court of Common Pleas. Okay, go ahead. It was constituted from four judges belonging to the two courts that had been uninvolved at first instance. In cases of exceptional importance, such as the case of Mines, 1568, and R. v. Hampton, 1637, 12 common law judges, four from each division below, sitting in exchequer chamber might be asked to determine a point of law, the matter being referred by the court hearing the case rather than the parties. Though further appeal to the House of Lords was possible, this was rare because the 19th century. As rule, a judgment of the exchequer chamber was considered the definitive statement of the law. Certain judgments like Hampton, the case of ship money, caused political controversy. It was- Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> now y'all hear this. It said, in the case of ship money, it became a political controversy in regards to matters heard in the exchequer chamber. You know, just over here in the exchequer chamber. And we know exchequer chamber was considered hell, mm -hmm. all right? And we know ship money is a duty of tax. Now, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be short on explaining this because this is gonna be another lesson, but I'm gonna show you how divinely prepared we are as members of the King's Bench to deal with this money that our people have been subject by way of the institution of the House of Stuart, going all the way back to the wars of what we call the Bishop Wars and result of what we call shit money. Mm -hmm. Shit money, y'all. Very important word, shit money. Why? Because shit money was a tax put on the colonies here in what we call North America on the English colonies. They ain't talking about the English people. They talking about the colonies that have been on plantations created by a charter granted to them by the English grantor on behalf of the heirs and successors who we are, which was broken by the colonies now called states, all right? Mm -hmm. Because the minor at this time was imposed as taxes upon the plantation or colonies that were not supposed to be without the act of parliament. Parliament dissolved in uh, 1629 by Charles I. It was dissolved on regards to the same issue regarding ship money. We started in 1619 with King James, the sixth of Scotland, under the, the Church of Scotland, which started by John Knox, which goes back to the Kingdom of Scotland under the head of Kenneth of Alpine. 
McAlpin. Mm. I've never done it at all. All right? On the ship money. And who were they shipping in 1619? Slaves. They were shipping slaves, cargo, merchandise, violation of the Charter of 1606 because it was trickery upon the 1606 Charter. Which clearly says in the 15 or 16 clause, look it up, uh, any trickery found upon the charters uh, on the on behalf of the ancestors' concessions who were six heirs of the king who granted the right to the come here, everything is confiscated. How we know it's confiscated? Because we're coming for it. We're yep. coming for it. All right? Let's do a ship money before we go on with our lesson. What is ship money? Read that first one, Archbishop. Ship money was a tax of medieval origin levied in intermediately in the Kingdom of England until the middle of the 17th century. Assessed typically on inhabitants of coastal areas of England, it was one of several taxes that English monarchs could levy by a prerogative without the approval of parliament. The attempt of King Charles I from 1634 onwards to levy ship money during peacetime and extended to the inland counties of England without parliamentary approval provoked fierce resistance and was one of the grievances of the English property class in the lead up to the English Civil War. Okay. So on the ship money, King James is started in 1619. Then Charles I, which is the son of King James, uh, took it upon himself to follow the same practice. Uh, and he petitioned the petition rights on in 1628. It was denied by Parliament. Mm -hmm. Even though Parliament was under the Commonwealth, a uh, de facto, as a result of the English Civil War, uh, which was, which was uh, the English Civil War, uh, was a result of um, uh, what Charles is doing. Because in 1634, there was a sick retreat, sick retreat made with Philip IV for ship money to be to finance King Charles and the funding of or the fitting of ships. All right. But let's first find out the origin of ship money and who uh, founded the origin of ship money. Traditional practices. Traditional practice. The Plantagenet kings of England had exercised the right of requiring the maritime towns and counties to furnish ships in time of war. And this duty was sometimes commuted for a money payment. Although several statutes of Edward I and Edward III, notably their confirmations of Magna Carta, had made it illegal for the Crown to exact any taxes without the consent of Parliament. The prerogative of levying ship money in time of war had never fallen wholly into abeyance. In 1619, James I aroused no popular opposition by levying 40,000 pounds of ship money on London and 8,550 pounds on other seaport towns. Okay. Opposition. In 1628, Charles I having prorogued Parliament in early summer and after his ascent to the petition of right, proceeded to levy ship money on every county in England without parliament. Issuing writs require 173,000 pounds to be returned to the exchequer. This was the first occasion when the demand for ship money aroused serious opposition. In view of the declaration in the petition that your subjects have inherited this freedom, that they should not be compelled to contribute to any tax, tallage aid, or other like charge not set by common consent in parliament. Stop. So now the plantation under the, the colonies were upset with the paying of ship money under the house under the Commonwealth created by the Stuart family. They were upset. This is this this is why King Charles I got executed. This is exactly why he was executed. All right, by going against what Parliament said, because it said Parliament said the Crown could not do nothing without the consent of Parliament. Parliament of England, Parliament of Ireland, a Parliament of Ireland is Parliament of Scotland, Ireland, and England. There's two different parliaments under one king. Yeah. One minor. These minors were de facto because they were minors of Scotland. Under the Church of Scotland called the Kirk. It's where the Starship Enterprise come in, Captain Kirk. That's where that come in. 
It's not the English church, but yet they're mindless for the king of England, of the kingdom of England. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's go here. Another five minutes. So he petitioned in 1628 a right to tax parliament, and it went before the ex, ex chamber uh, by judges, which was de facto, and it passed. It's called the uh, Hayden. We should go back. Let's go back here. R.B. Hamden, it was the case. He lost it mm -hmm. because King Charles influenced uh, Parliament to do it, not Parliament, to, to, uh, the, the colleagues to do it anyhow. And this is why you had the, what we call the War of the Bishops, the English Civil Wars, but led into what we call the Glorious Revolution, which resulted in what we call the Bill of Rights of 1689, or who would inherit the crown. All right, now let's just show you that America uh, intended on doing the same thing that the United Colonies were doing because they weren't called it the United States. They were called the United Colonies. Yep. yep. All right, let's find out. It takes scholarly work to do this, y'all. Sorry about that. United Colonies. Read that, Archbishop. The United Colonies was the name used by the Second Continental Congress for the emerging nation comprising the 13 colonies in 1775 and 1776. Before independence was declared, it emerged as a colloquial phrase to refer to colonies as a whole. The precise origin is unknown, but John Adams used the phrase United Colonies as early as February 27, 1775, in his sixth letter entitled to the inhabitants of the colony of Massachusetts Bay, published in the Boston Gazette. Okay, now you need to, if you want to know American history, you got to know the history of Massachusetts and Boston. Mm -hmm. This is where the Revolutionary War took place. And in uh, order to know the, the know, uh, Boston, you got to know how Boston was financed. All right. It's called the Bank of Massachusetts or the Bank of Boston, which is now called Bank of America. All right. Let's see here. Read that first part. Um, they, have. they have declared our cause, their own, that they never will submit to a president in any part of the United Colonies by which parliament may take away wharfs and other lawful estates or demolish charters, for if they do, they have a moral certainty that in the course of a few years, every right of Americans will be taken away and governors and councils holding at the will of a minister will be the only legislatives in the colonies. Read that again, <laughs> read that again. It said- Y'all better listen. They have declared- Y'all better reckon, listen what he's saying. Says they have declared our cause, their own, that they never will submit to a precedent in any part of the United Colonies by which Parliament may take away wharfs and other lawful estates or demolish charters. For if they do, they have a moral certainty that in the course of a few years, every right of Americans will be taken away and governors and councils holding at the will of a minister will be the only legislators in the council. Okay, y'all think we playing around? Do y'all think I'm playing around? Because I'm not. Mm -hmm. Let me show you how much or how serious we are and what we're doing. Todd just validated. Talking about 1776. We didn't have the Constitution for the United States. States, not colonies. States till March 4th, 1789. We, we're going back before that. 
because uh, you wouldn't have the United States before if you didn't have the Virginia plan and the, and the New Jersey plan called the Connecticut Compromise of uh, 1790, 17, somewhere around the 1790. But listen what the Constitution of New Jersey of 1776, the state of New Jersey, all right? This is the state of New Jersey. Back in 1776, they were in state. They were colonies. How are we going to know that? Let's watch it. Read the first part, Archbishop. Whereas all the constitutional authority ever possessed by the kings of Great Britain over these colonies or their other dominions was by compact derived from the people and held of them for the common interest of the whole society, allegiance and protection are in the nature of things reciprocal ties each equally dependent upon the other and liable to be dissolved by the others being refused or withdrawn. And whereas George III, King of Great Britain was refused protection to the good people of these colonies and by assenting to the sundry acts of the par British parliament, attempted to subject them to the absolute dominion of that body and has also made war upon them in the most cruel and unnatural manner for no other cause than asserting their just rights all civil authority under him is necessarily at an end, and the dissolution of government in each colony has consequently taken place. Okay, so as we just spoke about ship money uh, undertaken by King James, the founder of the House of Stuart, as well as his son Charles I, who was executed as a result of that, and as as through his execution, uh, this this resulted uh, in what you call the Judica Act of 1640, and in 1640. Uh, uh, you had what they call um, uh, what was it? Um, the War of the Bishops in 1640, and the War of the Bishops learned went into what they called the War of the Three Kingdoms, which became the English Civil Wars. All right, it became the English Civil Wars. Very important history. So, we, and as we after the English Civil Wars ended, you had the restoration of the crown in 1660. All right, this is the history of Charles II, uh, William and Mary Orange, uh, Queen Anne, King George I, King George II, then King George III. You have to know this history, y'all, because if they're talking about the colonies who are plantations now are upset with Queen Anne did when she passed it to the House of Handover, mm -hmm. who are not subjects or heirs of the England. Now they have teed off, now they're being taxed from Great Britain. Now look what the states decided to do by declaring their independence in 1776. We go to Article 10. Read that, Archbishop. Okay, Article 10. Get to it. Scroll down to 10. Oh, it's just uh, getting there, all right. Article 10, it says that captains and all other inferior officers of the militia shall be chosen by the companies in the respective counties, but filled in general officers by the council and assembly. Okay. First of all, we're talking about New Jersey. Then it said, Captain. Why are you talking about a captain? Captains are on ships. Mm hmm. All right, very pay, pay close attention. And the assemblies shall have the part so the captain and all the inferior officers of the militia shall be chosen by companies. Listen to what it's saying, y'all. All the captains, captains on ship, and all the inferior officers who were the captains on the ships of the militias shall be chosen by companies and respective counties. Counties were called shires or hundreds back in our time. Mm -hmm. Now, on the title of uh, 48.1-6, they're not even legislatively constructed. And we know legislation derived from the Constitution. Why? Because we know by the legislation derived from the Constitution, which is the authority that people get their rights to do what they want, it's called their charter. Well, as you're going to see here, by the Constitution, in the amending of the Constitution, July 2nd, 1776, they went away from the obligation of the contract between the heirs and successors on behalf of the, on behalf of the grantor by way of heirs and successors, and now it's been subjugated by way of the trustees on behalf of these companies now. 
called Common Recovery. Common Recovery, we already talked about that. We're going to go into it. So we know that the companies are guiding the counties, and the counties are made up of companies operating under militia headed by a captain. Mm -hmm. Right? Let's go to Section Title 22. Now, that's for not the citizens of England, nor England, but the Constitution created for the state of New Jersey, as well as every other state who joined in, because New Jersey sets the tone. All right? So when New Jersey changed its name from a college to a state, every other state follows suit, which were colonies. Exactly. Either Great Britain, France, or Spain. It's all to see they throw you back to Great Britain by the Treaty of 1763. So all that belongs to Great Britain and under the jurisdiction of Great Britain under the king. But you separated from Great Britain in 1783 with the Treaty of Paris under King George III as a result of the taxes that were put upon the colonies, not the heirs. Mm -hmm. The Magna Carta said you couldn't tax heirs. The Bill of Rights said you couldn't, of 1689 said you couldn't tax heirs. Because King James knew it as well. He was in the air. Read uh, Section 22 of July 2nd, 1776 Constitution. It says that the common law of England, as well as so much of the statute law, as have been heretofore practiced in this colony, should still remain in force until they shall have been altered by a future law of the legislator. Such parts only accepted as are repugnant to the rights and privileges contained in this charter. And that the est inestimable right of trial by jury shall remain confirmed as a part of the law of this colony without repeal forever. Okay. So it clearly says that the law, common law of England, uh, in lieu of equity, civil and uh, uh, and uh, civil and criminal have uh, 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 is, can be governed under chancery. You know, especially if it's fraudulent. Uh, in regards to uh, heirs and successors who uh, are, are right, uh, the rightful beneficiaries by way of what we call the Sestu Quay Trust. Uh, it says in section 20, 22 that the common law of England, we know the common law to us is statutory, not steradice, i.e. case law, mm -hmm. all right? Not no made up law. Ours is legislative constructed from the constitution where it keeps these people in check. We're reading the legislative charter, we keeps those colonies, i.e. plantation owners who enslaved us in check. But you allow them to get away because you let them get away from colonies and become states. Mm -hmm. It says that the common law of England, as well as so much of the statutory law, statute law, as have been here so practiced in this colony. So that means that if it's a colony and the colony was subject to England, then you must be in England. Must be in England, yep. You must be writing England right now that still remain in force until it should be altered by the future law of the legislator of the legislator. We mean that they're still in force there. Mm -hmm. Title 16, chapter 1, section 28. It didn't say repel. It said amend, alter, but not repel, because it can't repel. Did you, you under uh Darwin versus College, as Archbishop said, that the law of second tier contracts must be upheld. Absolutely. Any charge, charge given by the Crown is valid until it can be proven invalid. And we're just going to prove it that all those charges given by the House of Stewart is invalid, right? Why? why? Because they were endured it under the kings of England. They were endured it of the kings of Scotland, called the Church of Scotland or Kirk, going back to Kenneth Alpine. And the Alpine family credits goes back to Germany. When you go back to Germany, I suggest you guys look up uh, Tacticus. Look him up. He wrote the book on the, 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 the Germania book, who invaded England. All right, we're going to that. We're going to have class on that as well. But to close up on July 2nd, 1776 Constitution, in regards to the common law of England, remain in force until altered or amended by the Constitution, but not repealed. And how we know it wasn't repealed, it says here, read that last part, Archbishop. 